Thank you everyone for joining me today as we talk about some zero touch machine secret access. Uh, my name is Michael Aldridge, uh, so that's what this talk is about. Uh, this is me, uh, I play with infrastructure Legos, I occasionally build them, uh, I do a little bit of development work in Go, uh, but often I like to assemble things like the HashiCorp suite into a complete solution. Uh, it's very fun to build something where there was nothing before. I work on several open source projects, uh, Void Linux, uh, NetAuth, uh, and a project called the Resin Stack, which was a turnkey distribution for HashiCorp Nomad. Uh, I currently, I'm an SRE at Backblaze. Uh, I make sure your data doesn't get lost. It's a fun job. Uh, the contents of this talk actually came out of the Resin Stack. Uh, the Resin Stack kind of took the idea of multi-cloud to its logical conclusion of, rather than just running on a handful of clouds, let's run on every cloud at the same time. And when you do that, you start running into some interesting problems. One of the big ones is how do you identify your machines? And so that's gonna be what this talk is all about, is how do we give our machines identity in a way that works on every cloud at the same time? So we wanna talk about this being a zero touch process. We definitely don't want this to be something that, uh, you know, it's an operational overhead, because things that become operational overhead, I find, don't get done. Um, so part of that's gonna involve solving the first secret problem. Uh, and like all named problems in computer science, this is a hard problem to solve. Uh, it's a problem that you could argue there is no complete solution to. But we're gonna solve it today. Uh, then we're gonna solve it securely, very important for something with secret in the name, and then we're gonna do that vendor neutral. And the vendor neutral part is the important thing I want to get to today. So when we talk about zero touch, how zero are we talking here? Because uh, zero comes in various levels. I kind of define this that we want a cloud-like experience. Uh, you know, if you run on Amazon Web Services, your VMs have a machine profile, which gives them an instance identity document. Uh, this happens automatically in the background. You don't have to do anything. Uh, if you're running on Google Cloud, you get a machine identity token and a similar solution for Azure. This is a great option if you're on these clouds because it's fully supported by the vendor, it rotates on its own, it's integrated with their authentication systems. But if you're not on the cloud, if you're running bare metal, if you're running uh, perhaps in your VMware environment or your OpenStack or anything like that, you still really want to have this function uh, of a zero touch machine identity. What we don't want is we don't want a human in the loop. Like every time we boot a machine, uh, we don't want to have to file a ticket down to security to have them issue an identity to it. What we really don't want is we don't want them to have to file a ticket to get a new machine identity every quarter. Uh, so anything we deploy needs to be automatic. We don't want to have anything that's going to expire without a human, with a human having to renew it. We don't want anything that requires a human to provision in the first place. So let's talk about this first secret problem. Uh, this is a problem that Vault both creates and solves. Uh, and those are really annoying problems because it means you create a circular dependency through your infrastructure. And those are very bad, but only when uh, you need to rebootstrap your infrastructure, which is usually in the middle of an outage. So let's avoid that. So the first secret problem is really referring to you need some piece of authenticating information on the machine in order to authenticate to Vault. In this case, I'm talking about Vault as being both our secrets nexus as well as our authentication nexus. You know, once you have that Vault token, you can exchange it for other kinds of token, other credentials, dynamic secrets. You have lots of options, but you have to have a Vault token before those options are available to you. The best way to kind of think about this, if you're not really familiar with this, uh, is we want to give the machine basically a driver's license or an employee ID, you know, something that's standard across the organization, has a known format, we can work with it. So there are many ways to solve this problem. Um, I have a younger brother, and growing up, uh, one of our favorite board games was Monopoly. And if you've ever played Monopoly before, you may be aware that the correct way to win is with clever rules lawyering. 
Um, if you read the rules that come in the box, there are all kinds of things most people ignore. So what if we could solve this problem that way? What if I use uh, Ansible or Chef or Puppet to just push a token? The uh, orchestrator can authenticate to Vault, it can mint an app role, and then it can put that on the machine. Eh, that works, but we kind of just moved the problem one layer down. Now those systems need to securely authenticate the machine. Mm, what if I'm using Packer? I could, uh, as part of my post-provisioning workflow, I could just uh, get an app role and I could burn that into the image. Please don't do this. Uh, there was an excellent talk earlier today uh, about uh, secrets need to match your infrastructure and that places that burn secrets into containers, into VM images, have many more problems when it comes to actually keeping custody of their secure data. So don't do that. Uh, what if you do something really clever that I haven't thought of yet? Well, in that case, I'll be hanging out after this talk in the hallway. Please come talk to me. Okay, so we can't rule and slow our way out of this. Can we do something questionably secure? Um, you know, can we get 90% of the way there? You know, what if we put the vault token in a custom DHCP option? So when the machine comes up, we can, we can get it out of that. Uh, there is an RFC actually for authenticated DHCP. Uh, I don't think any currently maintained DHCP server implements this, but there is an RFC for it. Uh, perhaps a rainy day project. If we're in a VM, uh, we could always hand off the secure token using a kernel command line option. Uh, you know, just put it right there on the command line, pluck it out of uh, proc command line later, all done. Eh, not quite. That value is readable to everything on the machine that has sufficient permission to read the proc file system. Vault tokens really need to be more constrained than that. We don't want to let just anyone have one. Uh, and this also kind of is the same problem with our orchestrator. Now your hypervisor needs to be able to mint tokens and identify your machines. What about magic flash drives? Let's put a vault token.txt on a flash drive, plug it into every machine in the fleet. Um, I've done this before. I was a college student working on a project with no budget. Uh, it works. Uh, it's labor intensive. Your time is better spent elsewhere. Maybe a bulk rate on YubiKeys? You know, they work for humans. Uh, what if we just go plug a YubiKey into everything? Well, that kind of gets into the same problem as the flash drive. Uh, and most of the time, the whole point of the YubiKey is that you touch it. Like, you know, it blinks at you, you touch it, it validates you're there. Uh, the machine, unless we're gonna get really clever with like servo-operated fingers, uh, it can't tap the key. All right, we're gonna have to actually solve this problem. Uh, so, Let's put hardware aside for a moment. Hard, you know, running physical fleets is a problem that uh, I enjoy in my day job, but relatively few places do now. So let's talk about you know, the ways that Vault can auth. It has many auth methods uh, that are first party supported by HashiCorp. Uh, many clouds have a way for the machine to identify itself. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, if you're on Amazon, you could always just use the Amazon auth method uh, and your machine can send its instance identity document to Vault, receive a Vault token, and you're done. If you run on one cloud, this may be a great solution for you. It's relatively straightforward, it's low ops overhead, and it's going to work. But what if you run on multiple clouds, but your vault cluster is only in one of them? Like, maybe you have a machine learning workflow that you're normally resident in AWS, but you have one or two special machines in GCP so that you can use tensor processing units. Eh, okay, well, maybe this, this cloud-based approach isn't gonna work quite as well as we thought. Uh, there's also kind of the problem of what if you're running on many, many clouds, like uh, DigitalOcean? Well, DigitalOcean has some capabilities, but they don't map one-to-one -to, -one to the big three. Uh, same for many of the other smaller clouds. So as we look at the options that are available to us, you know, the things that Vault supports, we've kind of got username and password, You've got app role. Uh, if uh, you are find you're too happy with life and need to fix that, we've got Kerberos. Um, we can go put key tabs on everything. Uh, and we've got you know, a handful of the other auth methods. So really what we want here is we want a vendor neutral option. We want something we can ship everywhere, even to physical machines running in the on-prem data center. As I mentioned, we could use the trusted orchestrator approach. You know, we could say we have Ansible, we have Chef, we have Puppet, 
push the token to the machine. Um, if you have a trusted orchestrator that can already identify your machines, uh, you've already solved this problem. Uh, go back two spaces and lose a turn. If we're running on hardware or a, a platform like that, we could use something like Open Titan or a TPM, a trusted platform module. Uh, if you have those fully deployed, those are a great option. They provide a cryptographic root of trust on the machine. Uh, if you have those fully deployed, my hat is off to you. Those are uh, quite hairy to deploy and a little hairy to maintain. But they do fully solve this problem. So really what we want here is we want something that we already have and that we can repurpose for this. We want something that's already production grade. We want something that we're already maintaining. We want something that is already considered secure in our environment. It's time for a hot take. You ultimately trust your DNS. And you trust your DNS blind, which is exactly what we want to solve this problem. So, really? You trust your DNS? Well, uh, if you're using IPv6, partially dual stacked or fully dual stacked, I certainly hope you're using uh, DNS. Uh, if you're memorizing IPv6 addresses, that's interesting. Uh, you likely are already using DNS from a handful of extremely fortified machines. Uh, you know, you don't let just anyone in the company change DNS. You probably have a, a strict change management process around it. And as the haiku tells us, if you lose DNS, you've lost the platform. Uh, so not much else matters until you bring DNS back. It's probably okay if you can't mint new machine identities while you're in that outage. Uh, you're going to need to break the glass anyway. But how can we use DNS to provide secure identity? Well, RFC 8555 uh, fully defines the automatic certificate management environment, better known as ACME. Uh, ACME provides multiple bindings. These are mechanisms by which you can prove that you control a particular DNS name. Uh, they are mechanisms by which we can validate from beyond the local machine, crucially, that you have control of the name. ACME's ultimate result artifact is a trusted X509 certificate, and uh, conveniently, Vault can accept a trusted X509 certificate as an authentication document. And as an added win, we get built-in credential rotation even for the machine identities. Uh, ACME has this as a first-class concept, uh, it's something that's extremely well supported and extremely well battle tested now. So am I telling you to use Let's Encrypt to auth to Vault? No, absolutely not. If, the, if you don't remember anything else from this talk, it's uh, don't use Let's Encrypt to auth to Vault. Um, we need a private ACME certificate authority. Uh, we need it to be private because the way the Vault certificate auth mechanism works is it looks at a CA certificate or an intermediate certificate and validates the signature on the certificate you present. So if we hand it the Let's Encrypt uh, ISRG X1 root, there are several tens of millions of certificates on the internet that can now authenticate to Vault with that cert. We don't want that. Uh, so we need to run an internal authority. A couple of choices for this. Uh, you know, I like to keep things open source. Uh, I like to be able to see the code I'm running. We could run Boulder. Um, for those who don't know, Boulder is the software that runs Let's Encrypt. Uh, it's fully open source. There are deployment guides for it. It is a modern microservices architecture. Let's see if there's other options. We could run uh, small step certificates. Uh, this kind of ticks the box of being like a single Golang binary. It's statically linked. Drop it anywhere and it'll work. Uh, it's a smaller project, so depending on the size of your fleet, you might have scaling concerns with it. We could even do something like an ACME registration authority in front of another vault. Uh, a registration authority simply provides a mechanism by which you can complete the ACME identity transaction, and then it provides a token to the actual CA. So we could use the vault PKI backend. It's worth pointing out that as with any large system, with any of these options, you likely wouldn't run just one. This is something that you would likely deploy to every region you're resident in so that you maintain that capability in the event of a network partition. So for the purposes of this talk, I'm gonna talk about step CA as an internal PKI route. Um, I have deployed Boulder before, 
at a large organization where you have tens of thousands of machines, it's probably a good choice. But if you're a small organization or you just want a proof of concept, it's a lot bigger than you need to run. Uh, as I mentioned, Step CA is a uh, small, easy to set up uh, system. Uh, you can actually back it with an HSM, either a cloud HSM or something that's PCKS11 compatible. It's easy to add additional attributes to the cert if you want, and of course, because this is an internal certificate authority, we don't have to play by the rules of the CA baseline forum. Now, what does that mean? If you don't uh, eat, sleep, and breathe global PKI uh, rules, it means we can do things like uh, certificates that are valid for IPs. We can do certificates that are valid for things that aren't valid domain names, like let's say we're on uh, Amazon. You know, every instance has an instance identity that's I-something. Well, we could put that into the certificate as a trusted value that we've now cryptographically validated. And of course, like any software we want to put into an automated context, we need an HTTP API for further automation, and the STEP system provides that. Uh, we really want to be monitoring this. Of course, we need to get the logs for it. Uh, we want to probably feed this into our single pane of glass for production monitoring to know how many certificates we're issuing, you know, what is the status of our, our signing keys, things like that. So what does this actually look like? You know, what is the, what are the mechanics of doing this? Well, uh, I very much like Terraform, so here's some Terraform for you. Uh, you set up the Vault authentication backend. Uh, you tell it it's a certificate authentication system, uh, and I always like to set a description on everything I can in Vault. You know, it may make sense to me when I'm writing the code and setting it up initially, but six months later when I need to change it or make a patch to it, I'm not willing to trust my memory and I'm definitely not willing to trust, you know, the docs that I may have just written in haste and posted to the wiki. Uh, so I always like to set the description in the place where I'm using it. We then create a bunch of roles. Uh, each role has its own certificate root. So this can either be your CA root, or this can be uh, a intermediate root that you're using to issue that. Uh, if you're running multi-region, you could probably do this as the region root or the top level root. We need to tell it a token TTL. Um, you'll note those values are very small. Those are in seconds. We'll come back to that later. Uh, and of course, like any vault authentication mechanism, we now need to tell it some policies we want to issue. Uh, since this is for machine identity and it's very unlikely a machine is going to authenticate using multiple mechanisms, we don't bother with identity groups or identity entities to be able to, uh, you know, dedupe our auth items. Finally, we can set some extra attributes on this. And for the purposes of this talk, uh, I'm using the allowed names attribute. And what this does is it looks at the subject alternative name field of the certificate. Uh, this is a field that contains normally the DNS name for the certificate, but because this is our private certificate authority, it contains whatever we want. Uh, it's a list of string. One of those values needs to appear in the certificate to satisfy the allowed names property. As you can see, this is really easy. Uh, you know, it's small enough Terraform that I can even put it on the slide and have the font still be readable. Uh, you may note this is using a for each, so let's take a look at what that variable structure is looking like. This is a map of role to certificate, policy, and attribute. So uh, in this case, uh, I'm using the root certificate from my certificate authority as the validating uh, point. Remember, this is a public certificate. You don't need to protect the CA cert in the same way that you need to protect the CA key. Uh, the cert is public, the key is not. We then add the policies we want. Uh, default is not really necessary to have in a production environment. This comes off of one of my test clusters, uh, and it's nice to have a policy that you know at all times Vault should be able to issue. I then have two machine roles here. Uh, in my environment, I have an all-in-one server role. Uh, so this gets a policy of a resin nomad server, and I'm only allowing a single machine to claim this, this role. Uh, I have a specific machine that I've chosen to delegate this authority to, and I allow it to claim this role. Uh, the allowed names field is globable. Uh, so if you're familiar with the vault globbing convention, where you can do a shell style match, uh, it does support that field. 
So perhaps if you have a DNS scheme where you have a nomad dash server dash and then some number, you could tell it that your allowed names are nomad dash server dash star. Uh, and that will allow any nomad server to request this role out of vault. In my environment, anything that's not a server is then a worker, and so I let anything that has a valid certificate claim the worker role. It's worth pointing out that since I tend to deal with physical hardware, I can still lean on the castle and moat a little bit. Uh, it's very hard to hack a physical locked rack sitting under my desk at home, uh, especially when it's not plugged into the internet. Um, and I recognize by saying that I've just invited, you know, all manner of security pen testing against this uh, system sitting at my house. So this is the Vault policy map. This is really easy. You can extend this as far as you want, have thousands of policies. Um, it'll work just fine. You keep adding them. What do the clients look like? How do we consume this? Well, if you're using the Vault agent, uh, it's really easy. Use AutoAuth. Uh, so using AutoAuth, uh, we tell it this is a certificate authentication. We point it at the mount path. Uh, I like to have multiple mount paths for my multiple auth engines based on if this is like a human authenticating or a machine authenticating. So I, I tend to keep them separate by path. Tell the machine what role it's going to try and claim, uh, just so that if you have overlapping certificate policies or you have overlapping trust, uh, you know exactly what this server is going to get. I point the CA certificate, client certificate, and client key. These are all things that are living in the run directory. I consider these ephemeral secrets. These aren't things we're going to persist because we can always get them again dynamically. And then we just need a, a, a sync to uh, put the generated vault token into. Once you have the agent up and you have the vault token, you can either continue to use the agent to perform templating. Perhaps you need to put some additional bootstrap secrets onto the machine or some additional identity documents so that your provisioning system can take over. Or perhaps this is as far as you need. Once you have the vault token, you can consume it directly by your applications and have them talk directly to the vault. What does the ops experience look like with this? I mean, I, I recognize that in uh, about 22 minutes, I've told you a new way to authenticate to vault and that it's so great you should all go home and do it. Well, I think the, auth the ops experience on this has been pretty good. Uh, I've been running this with uh, my resin stack development cluster for about a year now, uh, and it works really well. I've only had one case where a machine got stuck and couldn't renew its certificates, uh, and that happened, you know, about what you'd expect. The certificate expired, vault timed out, the machine dropped off the fleet as all of its tokens became invalid. This is a problem, unfortunately, you're going to have in any kind of system where you require constant renewal of your authentication documents. So it's best to perhaps have monitoring on this so that you know in advance that the document failed to renew. Now, I mentioned earlier that those values were in seconds and they were quite low. You can take certificate rotation to some pretty insane levels. Uh, in my test environment, because I want to make sure this all works and I, I don't really have any, any production services there, I issue certificates with a 10-minute lifetime. Uh, and because of the way that Acme renewals work, that means every six minutes, the certificate is getting renewed. And this works. You know, the Acme transaction completes. It notifies Vault that the certificate on disk has changed. Vault reloads, reauthenticates, and continues as usual. And, you know, as an added bonus, I know everyone here has already got Vault encrypted. We would never expose it uh, with a plain text connection to our networks. Uh, but just in case you were, this does give you mutual TLS for your Vault, uh, because you have to have TLS enabled for this authentication method to work. It actually checks the inbound certificate chain on the HTTP object. Where to go from here? Well, uh, go forth and secure your fleets. Uh, it's uh, really not as hard as you might have thought. This is something that you should be able to do in about a day, uh, about a week at most. Use your newfound internal CA powers for good. Uh, so, you know, there's kind of this question of, uh, well, I have STEP now, or I have my Boulder CA, and I have Vault PKI. Which one do I issue certs from? This is something that your organization has to decide. Uh, my stance is that the Acme CA is considered bootstrap infrastructure, and so we don't want to use bootstrap infrastructure for when we're running in the steady state. Vault also provides us with an extremely nice audit log, uh, 
Uh, and it's nice if all of your secret issuance is coming out of a single point, all streaming into that audit log, all streaming into your seam, your security team will be much happier. Remember to keep your CA secure. Uh, you have to treat this certificate authority equivalent to an LDAP server or an Active Directory uh, mirror server. It is a root of trust for, your, for an identity system into Vault, and because machines often have higher power secrets policies than humans do, this is an extremely critical system. So think about your CRL workflow, your certificate revocation list. So this is how, if you, in the unlikely event of a compromise, how do you invalidate the certificates that were involved in that compromise? Uh, you basically, it's a fancy way of saying you put the serial numbers in a text file and you upload it to Vault. Um, but you probably need to have that automated. And you need to think about how frequently are you pushing your CRL to Vault. You also need to think about what your rotation interval should be. You know, uh, 10 minutes works. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it for a production environment. Maybe go with something that gives you a little bit of time to react. Uh, I think probably two days, three days, probably a happy medium somewhere in there. Depends on if you have weekend coverage for if you're willing to allow a certificate to have an expiry that will land on a weekend. But at any rate, these are concerns that you have to think about in your organization. You also need to think about if you're going to run you know, a single monolithic CA, or you're going to have uh, a forest of trust and have them all trusting back up to a unified route. These are all options, all things to think about, but at the end of the day, the underlying technology is not that complicated. It's extremely battle-tested, and it's easy to deploy. With that, I want to thank you very much for your time and for listening to me uh, tell you about this mechanism. Feel free to email me questions if you have any, and I'll be hanging out out in the hallway after the talk.